Hello, I'm Audrey Kurth Cronin. I'm Trustees Professor and Director of CMIST at Carnegie Mellon University. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Admiral James G. Fogo. He's a distinguished sailor, scholar, and statesman. Admiral Fogo graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1981 and was commissioned as an ensign. He retired nearly 40 years later, highly decorated and at the rank of four-star admiral. His career included nine command tours, beginning with the attack submarine USS Oklahoma and culminating as head of Naval Forces Europe, Naval Forces Africa, and Naval Allied Joint Forces Command Naples. He's an Olmsted Scholar and Moreau Scholar, and he earned a Master's of Public Administration from Harvard University and a Master's of Advanced Study in Defense and Strategic Studies at Strasbourg University. He has taught at the U.S. Foreign Service Institute and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he was also named to the American Academy of Diplomacy, which is a rare honor for a flag officer. Currently, he's the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. Admiral Fogo has generously agreed to join us here at CMIST for a conversation on naval strategy, technology, and leadership. And in order to conduct that conversation, I want to hand things over to Dr. Patrick Cronin, who is Asia Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute and also Carnegie Mellon Scholar in Residence. So take it away, Patrick and Jamie. Thank you very much. It is a great uh, pleasure to be here with Admiral Fogo at the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Security and Technology here in Dietrich College. Uh, Admiral Fogo, again, welcome. Um, I wanted to uh, engage you on a wide range of subjects from your career to life in submarines to maritime strategy to thinking about technology and sea power, if I may, here. Um, and very much appreciate your, your time, your experience. Um, as Audrey said in her introduction, you've got an incredible, remarkable career um, of, uh, in defense, in the Navy, in diplomacy and leadership. Um, so let's maybe begin with your Naval career. Just even the very beginning, you're a Naval Academy graduate. How did you end up at the Naval Academy? Well, that's a, that's a great story, uh, Dr. Cronin Patrick, if I may. And uh, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Audrey Kurth Cronin, uh, Audrey, uh, for the invitation here today <clears throat> to sit down with you and uh, kind of review maritime strategy in the Navy uh, from a very holistic approach. And so, uh, you know, my journey to the uh, United States Naval Academy was an interesting one. Um, I was uh, born overseas in uh, Rheindalen, München Gladbach, NATO Northern Headquarters. My father was a uh, Commonwealth officer served with the Canadian forces, and uh, so did his father, and so did my mother's father. Wow. And we were uh, posted to the United States in 1968, a dream assignment for my dad as a Canadian defense liaison officer in Washington, D.C. And uh, as I uh, entered the fourth grade and became Americanized, uh, by the time I was 17 years old, it was time to make a decision. My dad had retired decided to stay in the States as a permanent resident. And uh, I read a book by Jimmy Carter in 1976 <laughs> called Why Not the Best? And uh, it was the question Admiral Rickover asked him when he applied for the uh, nuclear power program in the United States Navy. And I got the bug and I applied to the U.S. Naval Academy and I was really fortunate to get in. So uh, I <clears throat> graduated from the Naval Academy in 1981. With chemistry, is it? That's right. I was a chemistry major, and I had intended originally to try to uh, take the medical college aptitude test and enter the uh, medical service. Uh, but Admiral Rickover uh, put a stop to that. He was, he was losing a lot of candidates uh, for the nuclear power program. So unless you had a, uh, a physical uh, uh, reason, you, know, you had to have... You could be colorblind or you could have something pop up at the Naval Academy. Uh, those individuals were allowed mm -hmm. to apply for uh, uh, the medical program, but uh, not, uh, not the rest of us. So um, I went in to see Admiral Rickover in 1980. I was one of the last two classes to do an interview. And, uh, you know, ironically, later in my career, I served at Naval Reactors with Admiral Skip Bowman. And as I walked through the door of Admiral Bowman's office, uh, ensconced in a case, is the chair that I sat in and so did thousands of other naval officers when they interviewed with Admiral Rickover. 
and Admiral Rickover was, uh, they called him the kindly old gent. Uh, <laughs> sometimes he was not so kindly, but he had, a, he had a sense of humor, a very dry sense of humor. And he cut two inches off the front uh, This two was like legs. North, North Korean interrogation <laughs> tactics. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly that bad. But, uh, he, you know, you, you, were, you were walking into this room, and, of course, the rumors were, you know, hey, be careful when you sit on the chair because it's imbalanced. But it's just the, the first two inches of the two legs in the front were cut, and then I think they pledged the seat. So we're all wearing our service dress blues, you know, very uh, starched uniform. And uh, as soon as you sat down, you slid, and he would comment on posture or something else. And it was just to kind of put you up back on your heels and put you off guard and see how you reacted to a situation that was uh, not a canned scenario, because he wanted officers who were able to think, think through problems. And so, you know, as I walked in, there was a commander who was with me, who was a prospective commanding officer. He had a, a, his hand in the small of my back. The door was shut. Rickover was on the other side. And a lot of guys got nervous. And so the reason for the hand on the small of your back is when that door went open, you were pushed in. <laughs> you were going into the ring with the gladiator, right? And uh, so it was interesting for me. I had uh, uh, done an exchange semester at the United States Military Academy for an entire you know, six, seven months. I went to jump school, went to, to the military academy. And Admiral Rickover was going down through my records. And all of a sudden, there were about six courses with course numbers he didn't recognize. Hmm. And he said, what's this? I don't understand, you know, that, I don't know, trench digging and tactics. <laughs> and then he threw a fit because he thought I had uh, wasted a, an entire semester of my time as a chemistry major. And of course, <clears throat> the prospective commanding officer, the guy who had the, the hand on my back, he's to my left and behind mm -hmm. me. And Admiral Rickover said, uh, don't you think he wasted uh, six months of his life? And of course, the answer was, yes, sir, Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I was yes. done. I wasn't going to get in. I did get in, and you know you could summarize my career in really three, uh, three steps. I did about uh, 12 years underwater in the submarine force during the Cold War, and then uh, you know about uh, 12 years ashore, most of it uh, inside the Pentagon. And uh, I don't mean to be uh, cute, but 12 years in the Pentagon was uh, worse than 12 years underwater. <laughs> I would have much rather been out on submarines. Hmm. And then about 12 years in overseas assignments. Uh, so I was very, very fortunate. Commanded nine times, and that's a blessing. And then the rest of my time, I did almost 40 years, was in schools, uh, graduate education, and then pipeline schools for the submarine force. And so I, I felt blessed that uh, I met Hyman G. Rickover, the iconic creator of uh, the nuclear power program. Who else would have been able to marinize a nuclear power plant, put it on a submarine, and win the Cold War? And uh, so that's a, that's a piece of history that, uh, you know, I will carry with me to the end. And, uh, and then to, to actually be privileged to command a submarine uh, in the United States Navy Submarine Force, and one that was operational for all three years. We deployed three times, and uh, I've got two of my department heads that are now admirals, and one of them is about to be uh, the commander of Submarine Force Atlantic, who's my navigator, Rob Goucher. And uh, the other one is, uh, I'm pretty sure, going to be the commander of Submarine Force Pacific, my uh, engineer, uh, Rick Seif. So I couldn't be prouder of that legacy of that ship, <clears throat> and it was Rick Over who gave me that opportunity. Hmm. Going, going back, though, to your naval career, in terms of the lessons you learned along the way as yeah. a, a naval officer rising up to the ranks to four-star admiral, what was what was important to you early on in your career that you were able to succeed and reach the, the pinnacle of power in, inside the Navy? Well, you know, uh, going to the Naval Academy, it was like a, an a la carte menu of things to do, you know, whether it was uh, uh, classes, extracurricular activities, uh, sports. I just played intramural sports, but and the camaraderie was great. And when you get to the fleet, <clears throat> you go through nuclear power school, which is really, really tough, even as a chemistry major, it's hard for me. I like prototype much better because I was hands-on. Mm. Uh, you know, I was up in uh, uh, New York for a prototype. And then I went through sub-school, that was a lot of fun. And I got to the boat, and then I realized, whoa, these guys are serious. Because it was 1983, mm -hmm. and uh, all the commanding officers on the waterfront had spent uh, copious amounts of time at sea. I mean, they were deploying for you know, the majority of uh, maybe nine, uh, nine months a year deployments were three months on, three months off, but then you'd pick up somebody else's uh, deployment and the ship was gone away from the families. Uh, that was sobering for me. I was engaged. I wasn't married. I got married when I was on uh, my first boat. 
And uh, you know, suddenly I realized, wow, this is pretty hard work. And the first thing you do is they throw the reactor plant manual at you and you have to qualify in the plant. And then you qualify up forward. And it's a constant uh, studying, standing watch, uh, working on the boat, keeping the boat clean, keeping it maintained. So it, ins it instilled an incredible work ethic on top of what I learned at the Naval Academy. And when you graduate uh, from your whatever commissioning program and you head out in the fleet, I think that's something that's uh, a bit of a wake-up call for everyone. And uh, you have to be careful in what service selection you pick. Uh, I loved uh, being a submariner, but when I first got there, it was a little off-putting because I was on my own. <clears throat> you know, and uh, you know, you get some help uh, from the rest of the team, but you had to study hard and you had to pass those uh, qualifying exams. Once you got qualified, it was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a qualified watch officer as an engineering officer of the watch, and better yet, being up forward and driving the boat <clears throat> and understanding the boat was absolutely terrific. Uh, so as I went through those uh, early assignments, you know, you start in the propulsion plant, main propulsion assistant, work up forward, uh, you know, sonar officer, and then uh, I actually was lucky to become a department head on my first ship, which is, I don't think we do that anymore. It was a ship that didn't have Tomahawk missiles, but we had things like mines and torpedoes. And I was a weapons officer, and that was absolutely fantastic. Um, I went on to uh, uh, shore duty after that. I was very fortunate to, uh, to get some graduate education. And then I kind of shifted colors uh, in my second tour and went to an SSBN, a ballistic missile submarine, the USS Mariana G. Vallejo. She's one of the 41 for freedom. And uh, you know we built those ships in record time uh, at a bargain price. Uh, we have trouble with acquisition nowadays. Mm -hmm. That's a, a lesson learned. And uh, out on the Vallejo for almost three years, five deterrent patrols. I learned what it, uh, the nuclear psyop was all about. Um, I learned how important our deterrent posture was. And I learned one thing <clears throat> in deference to my friends in the United States Air Force, uh, the, the best and the most reliable and the most stealthy part of the triad between bombers, missiles, and submarines are those submarines out there. And that's why it's so important we build the Columbia class and get it out on time and on target. Then I went to be the XO on a great ship called USS Narwhal. Absolutely fantastic. It was one of Admiral Rickover's experimental ships, a prototype, different propulsion plant. And that's something Rickover, I, I can remember the engineers at Naval Reactors telling me, Rickover sometimes would scream, don't bring me paper reactors. He didn't want to see blueprints. He wanted to see, you know, bent metal steel and experimentation. And you know what, that, uh, we've lost a little bit of that uh, in the American spirit in our industrial base nowadays, but he would take risks. And you know, <clears throat> for Rick Over, if it was his risk, it was okay to fail. And so, you know, we've gotten away from that too. We're risk averse and we're averse to, uh, to failure because everybody thinks, oh my gosh, if we fail, we're gonna waste money. You know, there has to be some of that in order to get better and to compete with some of the adversaries we have today. Uh, not just Russia, uh, but China, you know, the, the big dog that is uh, giving us fits in the Western Pacific. And then the pinnacle of my career, Patrick, was uh, command of USS Oklahoma City. It was a great ship. Uh, sadly, about six months ago, we decommissioned her in uh, Puget Sound, Bremerton, and uh, an incredible turnout, you know. Uh, uh, probably almost a dozen former commanding officers, a uh, couple hundred members of, of all the crews. And you know, when I looked at the boat down in Dry Dock, I said to myself, it looks great. I mean, you know, let's, uh, let's float it and <laughs> let's take it down to Australia. You know, yes. that's, that's one of the interim solutions, but of course that's not gonna happen. Uh, so uh, when I left uh, Command at Sea, you know, we turned into a whole, uh, a whole new world of life ashore and on staff assignments and uh, uh, out uh, in the hinterlands in Europe uh, several times. And I really learned then after I became a flag officer what jointness was all about, how important that is, and how uh, working together as a team with our Air Force and Army brethren uh, makes us stronger and resilient and uh, the great power that we are today. Let me just stop there. Yeah, well, just again, back on this uh, exciting career, I mean, especially with Admiral Rickover, and, and he is a storied uh, legend in American history, uh, not just the Navy. And I'm, 
can we even have Admiral Rickovers today? I mean, is that possible? Do we do we allow that within our armed forces and within the Navy? You know, we've diversified quite a bit. Uh, Naval Sea Systems Command is a uh, it's the, that's our engineers. We have eighty thousand or so talented individuals that do all sorts of things, from contracting to to design to drawing. They're building these magnificent ships. You know, I'm excited about uh, uh, the Ford class carrier. I mean, it's received some criticism because of our uh, desire to experiment and prototype with the electromagnetic assisted launch. I think, uh, you know, if Admiral Rickover were around today, he would say, yeah, let's check it out. Let's go from what was hydraulic uh, launch of aircraft to steam to electromagnetic assisted launch. You know, one of my classmates, Bullet Miller, <clears throat> was the uh, air boss. Uh, in fact, he was air boss during uh, Top Gun Maverick, and I think he you know, he had a lot of interactions with Tom Cruise and the team, teaching them what it was like to be an aviator and pull nine Gs, right? So I went out on uh, USS uh, John F. Kennedy last year. It's in the yards down in Huntington, Ingalls, Newport News, magnificent ships. And we walked on deck with, uh, you know, our staff from the Center for Maritime Strategy in Washington. And uh, we approached the pit where uh, the electromagnetic assisted launch is being assembled. It's almost done. Kennedy is, uh, the nukes are on board the ship. Um, you know, it's probably got another year to go before they get her out of the, the docking area and over to uh, uh, the pier where they can start experimenting. Uh, Emol's works. And when I listened to Bullet talk about his first catapult shot, uh, you know, in a, I don't know, it was an A6 uh, intruder <laughs> or something like that, back on the Midway, which is now a museum, it was hydraulic. And he said it was like getting hit in the back of the head with a sledgehammer. Then he went to steam, steam catapults. And uh, he said that was not as dramatic. It wasn't as much of a punch. Um, and it was, it was more comfortable, but it was still, you know, you, you get jerked pretty hard when you, you, you take off. And now with the Emols, before he retired, uh, he did a launch and he said it was, it was unbelievable. It was like a smooth, you know, and you're in the air. That's progress. We wouldn't have done that if we hadn't, had, uh, we hadn't taken risk. And that's what Rickover was all about. So that ship has, 23 different prototypes on board, and uh, we had never done this before. That's a lot. I think the lesson learned is we might want to test those ashore before we put them on the platform at sea. And I think Rick over uh, probably would have agreed with that, although he was uh, you know, full court pressed to get stuff out, marinize it, get it out to sea and test it. Uh, I think the Ford is performing extremely well. She's on her first long deployment. And I think uh, we'll see how the sortie generation rate goes for those aircraft, but I think she's doing great. And I think the, the rest of the ships that follow, the Enterprise, the John F. Kennedy and the Dory Miller are going to keep the carrier air wing at sea and keep Americans safe for the next 50 years. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and I want to come back and talk about the carriers and the role of carriers in the context of maritime strategy. But again, just going back to, yeah. to Edward Rickover for a minute here. and. The challenge he uh, posed to anybody going through uh, his scrutiny and his program. Uh, uh, Audrey's brother, Steve Kurth, of course, yeah. had to go through Admiral Rickover as well. Yeah. Rather than ending up at sea, he ended up working at Naval Re Reactors yeah. for his entire career and, yeah. and doing distinguished things there. But what beyond Admiral Rickover, I mean, what was the biggest challenge or obstacle that, or some of the obstacles that you faced in your career? Because you've got such a successful pattern of, of, of success that it may seem to a young person interested in the Navy that, oh, you can't enter the Navy unless you're, you, you succeed in everything. But you must have had tremendous hardship at times or, 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 or challenges in your way that you had to deal with. What was, what was uh, one of the challenges that you dealt with in your excellent career? Yeah, I, I think uh, at sea challenges on the boats, uh, we run them hard. Uh, uh, we run them really hard. And we run our people hard, too. Uh, so as far as the machinery and equipment is concerned, readiness was the top challenge. And uh, readiness is still the top challenge today. You know, in uh, NAV Plan 2022, Admiral Mike Gilday has made that uh, his number one thing to, uh, to maintain or to fix. And with the industrial base uh, declining, it's much harder for us to get the maintenance done on time as these platforms get older. I certainly saw that in all of my boats. USS Sea Devil 637 class, Mariano G. Vallejo was 30 years old when I left and still running strong. She was a battle e-boat down in Kings Bay, Georgia. I mean, I love that ship. It was very simple systems on board, analog, not digital. Narwhal was unique, a unique propulsion plant which had unique problems. And then Oklahoma City was a front run in 688, uh, you know, one of the first flights with Fairwater planes. 
uh, we kept that ship in tip-top con condition, but it was always a challenge. And uh, you're always burning the midnight oil with your team, and you got to motivate that team because they have families. And you know, you go to sea for a long time. You come in, you expect to be able to spend a little downtime with your family. You're back on the boat, and you're fixing a pump or a valve, or you're trying to get ready for the next underway. So this is a constant challenge for us, and something that uh, you know Admiral Gilday has tried to get a grip on with his. Uh, uh, readiness is number one. And he's taken some heat from the Hill on that because the readiness account has to stay funded. So the ships we have today, which will be the ships that we have in 2030, can still go to sea and fight the nation's wars. And hopefully the next one's not in the Western Pacific, but that's where volume matters because right now the Chinese have got more ships than we do. So as I went through my life in the submarine force, that was, uh, that was a constant challenge for me, being ready to get underway. You don't want to have a failed to sail. But you can't be stupid as a commanding officer and say, uh, you know, if I don't have redundancy in my systems, I'm going to take some risk and I'm going to go to sea anyway. The other thing I've, I've found, uh, I was blessed with great people. You know, as I said, got uh, two admirals, hopefully one more coming up from that uh, wardroom of the USS Oklahoma City. Commanding officers, uh, some do this well and some don't do it well. Some want to manage everything themselves. Not me. I was a, a delegator of authority to uh, qualified and maybe even not so qualified people because how does somebody get better unless you give them a chance mm. you know one of the uh, one of the uh, I think probably the most nervous situations you have is driving out of Tidewater Virginia Charleston South Carolina some of these other maneuvering watches in foreign ports going through the Kattegat Skagerrak or store belts into the Baltic standing on the bridge of a submarine and having a J.O. Uh, in the cockpit giving orders to the helm. And uh, when I was on the USS Oklahoma City, there was a constant uh, reflux or flow of new life, new officers coming on board, and they've got to be trained. Uh, you've got to give them a chance. You can't be giving the helm and the rudder orders from standing up on that bridge. You've got to put the power into that Lieutenant JG or that Lieutenant, and he's going to make some mistakes. And so, you know, the mark, I think, of a good commanding officer is somebody who will delegate that authority give uh, give the lieutenant an opportunity to drive the ship and whether that's driving the ship or operating the propulsion plant or uh, the weapon systems when you're firing the mark 48 torpedo which is a pretty mean machine best in the world you're going to take some risk and then you've got to be smart enough and alert enough uh, to identify a problem before it happens and then do the course correction but in a way that's uh, characteristic of uh, a leader's ability to train his young officers, and that is, you know, you, you don't smack them hard, uh, you don't insult them, you might ask the question, Lieutenant, have you considered? Or if you see the ship standing into danger, you might want to take control of the helm and say left full rudder, not right full rudder, because you're going to run aground. So you, you can imagine being a little bit nervous, you know, for those three years and you're in command. And I'm looking at a commanding officer over here, uh, Captain Mike Tomman, who was the CEO of the USS Maine, and he's, he's nodding his head, you know, so he was there too. Uh, when you walk off the brow after a three year tour as a commanding officer, all operational, you feel pretty proud that you were able to do something like that, that the ship deployed, that the ship uh, hopefully received some accolades for what it had done. You know, we were, we still are the silent service. We don't talk a lot about our operational stuff, but uh, it's exciting out there. And I, I tell you what, you know, I took the uh, cloth of the nation off on September uh, uh, 30, or September 1st, 2020, and I'm back, uh, at Carnegie Mellon for the commissioning of our young second lieutenants and uh, our ensigns who are going to go off into the aviation arm and, and the submarine force. And we've got uh, three submariners in this class. I'm pretty proud of that and proud of uh, what uh, Professor Naval Science uh, Captain Tom has done. Um, I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. I wish I was raising my hand today <laughs> and, and going out in the world to do it. And, and what's your best advice to those, uh, those young people about to enter the Navy? Yeah, I think uh, my best advice is uh, you can't rewind the tape. Uh, today, everything's digital, right? So we don't have videotapes, we don't have cassette tapes, but I think uh, this generation understands what I'm saying. Uh, you get one shot, so uh, you know, uh, make the most of it. Uh, think through problems. And what I always used to tell my wardroom as we were getting ready for a mission uh, you know, in, in harm's way, in dangerous waters, 
uh, far away from the United States, or a maneuvering watch driving the ship into a foreign port we've never been before, or coming home. You know, uh, you know, uh, some uh, of the admirals that I work for said uh, the the Roger Bacon used to say uh, the last mile is the most dangerous. So you're coming home from a deployment. You've been gone for six months. Everybody's euphoric. They're they're not thinking about safety of ship necessarily. You want them to. They're thinking about their family. They're going to meet their wife. Maybe they're going to meet the kid on the pier they've never known because he was born or she was born while they were gone. So they're distracted. They're happy. They're euphoric. But you got to focus on the ship and the safety of the ship. So I would say, gentlemen, you can't rewind the tape. If we make a mistake, people are going to come down here and they're going to do the forensics and they're going to dissect every decision and everything we did and all of our records. So when we were getting ready for inspections, I would say, Think about the inspector or think about um, somebody coming on board for an investigation when we've done something wrong. Heaven forbid, run aground, hit something, run into something, hurt somebody. They're going to look at everything that we've done. So uh, with the authority that you have as an officer, as a division officer, as a chief petty officer, and chiefs run the Navy, uh, they're responsible for our crew. The chief of the boat is probably your most valuable guy on board the ship. He's your liaison with the enlisted personnel. Uh, with all that authority and responsibility that you have, have you looked at your own programs and are you certain and can you put your head on the pillow at night and go to sleep uh, with good conscience because you've done everything that you can to make sure that you and your division and the team, most importantly the team, the ship, is successful. And if you haven't, you probably need to burn the midnight oil a little bit more. Excellent, excellent advice and a great uh, career. I, I wonder, Admiral Fogo, if we can uh, talk about submarines. Sure. Uh, and if you can help the layman and, and the landlubber um, or somebody who spends time and you know, 17 hours in a tube flying over the Pacific, um, <laughs> now thinking, you know, you're going to be six months in a tube under the ocean. Yeah. Take a deep dive in, in that Oklahoma, USS Oklahoma, your first, uh, your first submarine. What, what was it like? In, in the submarine? What is, what is life like? You cannot communicate very well with the outside world, presumably, yeah. and yeah. you're in a very close space. You have a lot of technology, a nuclear reactor. You're with a lot of other men in, in very close quarters. How, how does that, how do you survive that? Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. I mean, flying over the ocean in, uh, in a tube for 17 hours, if you're heading down to Australia or something like that, is, is not unlike uh, being on a submarine, but uh, we do it for a longer period of time. You know, I think one of the deployments uh, I was on in command of USS Oklahoma City on a northern run, which is North Atlantic. Uh, we were underway 94% of the time in six months. And so the crew relished their uh, port visits, and I was always one to try to get them in to some places that they may never have seen before. You know, we went to uh, Zabrugi, Belgium, uh, which is a port city in Belgium, not far from Bruges. And I wanted to go there for a couple of reasons. I wanted to show them Bruges, which is absolutely uh, an incredibly, stunningly beautiful city, but one that my father liberated in World War II. He <laughs> was uh, he crossed the beach in Normandy at D plus 45, and the Canadian forces went up, and he was there when uh, Bruges became a free city and was liberated. and And the guys loved it, you know. Um, but you're underway for a long period of time on a tube that's 360 feet long if it's a 688. Uh, bigger if it's a Virginia class, about 35 feet wide with a sail that goes up about 25 feet. There's 140 guys on board that ship and not everybody has a rack or a bunk. So we do something called hot racking, which means one guy gets up, another guy rolls in. And you know, it's tiring and it's uh, everybody wants to get their rest, so it's not like the guy getting up puts new sheets down for you. So you know, this is, uh, this is a bit of a uh, a tough lifestyle down in the torpedo room you know they put bunks in the torpedo room and that was one of the premier places to stay because it was nice and cool and it was nice and quiet until you had a drill and then all hell breaks loose right and so you're out of the rack and you're out of the room and you could be out for a, a long time as they're moving weapons around and putting weapons in tubes and training uh, to reload as fast as we can in a wartime scenario when you leave the pier and you leave port and you go to sea for one of these deployments and you shut that hatch the mentality of the submarine force, even more so today, is you're going to war. And uh, that's the mentality. And so it's a warrior ethos and a spirit that is unmatched, in my humble opinion, and the rest of the Navy. And so while the team is out there, you're on a very busy uh, 
uh, watch schedule, you know, we were three sections, so six, six hours, six hours, six hours. And the way we determined, uh, you know, whether it was noon or midnight was what are they serving in the mess or the wardroom uh, for mid rats, you know, at, uh, at the 12 o'clock hour. And, uh, you know, if it was pizza, it was probably midnight. You know? And so you reorient your whole day around this 18 hour workday. Uh, we've since gone into different uh, uh, biorhythms that you know, allow the sailors to get a little bit more rest, which makes a lot of sense, but not in my day. And so keeping morale up is very important. Uh, talking to the troops is very important. And uh, you can tell, uh, you know, I'm a loquacious individual. I like to talk. I talk to my troops all the time. I let them know what we're doing. You know, uh, everybody on the submarine is cleared. Uh, and they have every right to know where we're going, what we're doing, how long we're going to be there, when our next port visit is. And, you know, like anything else in the Navy, you have to watch out for rumor control. So mm -hmm. there's a rumor, oh, we're not going to be able to go on board. Oh, we're going to get extended on deployment. You're going to kill that right away. Or if it's true and you're going to be extended because some, some message came into radio and it got out, you need to tell them right up front, hey, fellas, uh, we're going to be gone for another couple of weeks longer than expected. Uh, when I was uh, CO of Oklahoma City, it was an uh, all-male crew. And uh, we uh, fortunately had a wake-up call, and we waited way too <laughs> long in the submarine force before we brought women into the submarine force. And I have to tell you, Patrick, they are killing it at <laughs> Nuclear Power School. Uh, you know, I think the scores uh, have uh, well outmatched their male counterparts, and so I wish we had done this years ago. Would have helped us out with our recruiting and also our, our retention problems. So, you know, bravo Zulu to those young ladies and um, one here today that will commission or headed out for an exciting life in the submarine force. So six months is a long time to be underwater. Uh, you know, you can keep an egg fresh for 75 days. Now that may sound strange, which the, the Navy dips the eggs in wax. Huh. And so you have fresh fruits and vegetables for <clears throat> not more than about three weeks before they run out. And then you go to this ubiquitous thing called three bean salad, <clears throat> which is in a number 10 can. Yes. And if you get a, num a couple of uh, number 10 cans of three bean salad, you can feed the whole crew. Now it's okay once in a while, you know, it tastes pretty good, but when you have it over and over again. So the cook, the, the chief uh, mess specialist is really important on that sub mm -hmm. and probably one of the biggest factors in morale, you know, what the crew eats and they're, they're fed well. We, uh, we now have dietitians that are monitoring our menus. We didn't have that when I was back uh, uh, in command. Lots of steaks, lots of uh, ice cream from the ice cream machine. We had a cappuccino machine that ran out all the time. It was reloaded <laughs> every day. Guys loved it, but a little too much sugar there, you know, so we got to watch that. You got to watch your weight when you're on board because when you come back, you have to pass the physical readiness test. They don't go away. <clears throat> and on a tube that's, a, you know, 360 feet long and 35 feet wide, what do you do? We have free weights. Uh, we have uh, stair steppers. Uh, we had a running machine, hmm. but in order to get it down the hatch, we had to cut it up. <laughs> and then we had to weld it back together once it was down there. Hmm. The weights, if you drop a weight on a deck plate, it makes a big metal crank, you know, th a thud. That'll give you away. You could die. So we have to figure out, well, guys like free weights. They want to be able to lift. They want to be able to run. They want to do the stair stepper. They want to do crunches. They got to pass the PRT when they come back. So how do we solve this problem? So we would rubberize an entire area of the engine room to allow people to, you know, not uh, to, to work out, but not make noise. And so you have to put extra thought into everything on that ship. Uh, the strength of the ship, like the strength of the anchor chain is only as good as the weakest link. So let's talk about rig for dive. You know, we had uh, Scorpion and Thresher go down uh, mm -hmm. in the 60s, and we never wanted that to happen again. We instituted something called the SubSafe program. SubSafe, which is uh, uh, a hard look at all the uh, potential water type uh, fittings on the ship that could cause you a problem. Water in the people tank on a submarine is bad. So everybody is trained on how to mitigate that. Uh, we have something called rig for dive. So a first checker, second checker, and a third checker on valves that must be in a certain position when you dive the boat so water doesn't come in the people tank. And uh, we take that very seriously. You know, that is a zero defect program for the submarine force. I hate to say that we're zero defect, but you have to be with something like that. I always believed in forgiveness for anybody's sins who made a mistake. 
and they get a second chance. I did not like taking people to captain's mast and holding them accountable and potentially affecting their career by taking away a stripe or fining them for something, unless they really deserved it. You know, if it was a training problem, it was on me. If it was a, a, a malicious act, it was on them. And, and my team knew it. And I told them, I'm gonna treat you like an adult. And, and I mean that, you know, for young kids, 18, 19, and, or in their early 20s, I'm gonna treat you like an adult. And it matures you quickly because you realize, I may not have been responsible for my actions in high school. I might've been reckless and then I joined the Navy. Now I'm responsible and somebody's holding me accountable hmm. and uh, you will be held to account. But on rig for dive, zero defect. And uh, once that ship was rigged and we dove, if we found a mistake or we found something that was in, a, uh, in the wrong position, we did a critique. And this is something that Admiral Rickover instilled on the submarine force. When mistakes are made, you will do a critique and you will not brush this off. This is not something that's gonna happen in 15 minutes, everybody high fives and says, we're never gonna do it again, no. You do deep dive on that problem until you find the root cause. It could either be a mechanical failure or it could be a personnel failure. Again, something malicious, somebody ignored something, somebody was lazy, or it's a training problem. And then you go after fixing that root cause and then you monitor it and then you write it up and you put yourself on a report. And a commanding officer who comes home, I had a Commodore tell me this one time, I think it was uh, Commodore Zimborski, Stan Zimborski, iconic guy. When somebody comes and tells me everything's good on the ship and I'm, I'm the Commodore, he's not telling me the truth. So that makes me want to ride that ship and find out for myself. And <laughs> you know, here's another good one. Another great guy everybody knows and loves is Vice Admiral Al Canetzi. Yeah. So uh, Admiral Canetzi used to say, if you want to know what's going on in a submarine, go talk to lower level Louie. So lower level Louie is engine room lower level watch. And uh, when I became remarkably surprisingly to me, I was never uh, qualified to be an engineer on a submarine. My nuke grades weren't that good. I became the senior member of the Nuclear Propulsion Examining Board. So there are three of us in the Atlantic fleet. And when you go out, you evaluate the ship for the safe reaction, re, um, the safe uh, operation of the reactor plant. If you find serious mistakes, you know, you take away their keys and you say, you guys got to come back in and you got to be retrained. And sometimes you got to do some personnel changes. So the board is very serious about what it does. So while I was the senior member of the board, I took Admiral Konetsny's uh, advice to heart and I would go down into engine room lower level and talk to the newest qualified nuclear machinist made on the ship. Typically, it was the youngest guy. That was his first watch. And uh, you could tell right away uh, what the command climate was on the ship by talking to that young kid. And he would tell you, you know, I love it here. My engineer's a great guy. I've been well trained. I enjoy being on board. I like standing watch. The ship goes places and does things. The, the crew is a good team. Or you might get the other story, you know, that uh, micromanagers, command climate's not good, morale's not good, and the kid will talk to you. And, and then you can go and, you know, check it out for yourself. And that's not to say that, uh, you know, you, you, you can remove people uh, for the manner in which they command or operate the ship, but our job as an inspection team was not only to inspect, but it was to help. And Admiral Bowman told me that when I became the senior member. He said, you know, when you go down there, haranguing these guys and harassing these guys is not the purpose of what you're gonna do. You're gonna, you're gonna inspect them and you're gonna evaluate them against the fleet standard. And if they're not good enough, you're gonna tell them they're below average, below the fleet standard and they got some work to do. But you're gonna help them. You're gonna take best practices from other submarines out there and you're gonna lay them on the table. And you're not gonna tell the engineer, your training program is a shambles. You're gonna say, Ange, I think you, you could probably do better here. And here's an example from the last three boats that I just inspected. And this guy got an excellent, and that needs to be you next year. And oh, by the way, we're gonna come back next year and we're gonna assess what you have done from the time we leave tomorrow <laughs> until 12 months from now. And a lot of folks took that to heart. And it, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have that leadership approach, to uh, process improvement, continuous process improvement, critiquing, learning, fixing problems, getting better, then the ship will improve and become the battle e boat someday. And that's what every commanding officer wants to happen. Not just because it's a, an award, it's because you've done something to make the place better. And you know that's what we all wanna do and, and we aspire to when we're in command. 
Well, it starts with good people. Um, having the ethos that you're at war when you close that hatch, knowing that people like Admiral Rickover said we have to have perfection in the nuclear Navy in particular, but then you have this system in place for quality assurance and you're constantly trying to Absolutely. correct and, yeah. and get better. Um, so what happens um, when we're trying to help partners like uh, and allies like Australia yeah. create a nuclear navy? I mean, this is a, a phenomenal undertaking. Uh, never been, you know, uh, this is this is a decades-long enterprise. If this works, when you think about the Australia-UK uh, US uh, defense partnership and this decision to try to create nuclear-powered um, submarines for Australia uh, in the coming decades. How do you think about the challenges that the Australians are going to face creating what Admiral Rickover and others help pave the way for, this nuclear navy? Right. This is a huge challenge. But uh, uh, the first thing that I think everybody has to realize is you have to, you have to want it, right? Hmm. And I think the Australians want it, uh, and, and for good reason, because they live in a dangerous neighborhood. And China is growing more dangerous every day. And uh, they have an archipelago down there. You know. Uh, one of the former chiefs of defense, who's an Air Force Air Marshal, uh, Sir Angus Houston, yes. used to come and see my boss all the time, Admiral Mullen, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And Sir Angus would sit at the chair in, in the bunker outside the chairman's office, where I, where I uh, was assigned as a captain. It was it was an incredible assignment for two years. And uh, he had a slide the first time we went down to Australia. Sir Angus had a slide with uh, Australia in the center of the Mercator projection of the globe. And Admiral Mullen looked at it <laughs> and he was like, wow, you know, that's, that's an image or a projection I haven't seen before. And you look at Australia and of course the United States is up here and it's very small. And there's all these islands and all this water around them. And so they are an island nation like us, like the United Kingdom, and they want to protect their shores and they want to be able to uh, uh, help their allies and their partners with their own security needs as well. And so I think this is a great idea. And uh, you and I have both heard there's really two pillars. The first is you have to establish uh, you know, an industrial base and a program that can support uh, what Admiral Rickover started 70 years ago. And there's been 70 years of learning in nuclear power and operations and marine propulsion systems and submarines and safety. And we're going to try to impart that uh, on the Australians in a much faster uh, schedule of time. Mm. And that's okay if we're all in and we're a team as the United Kingdom and the United States and Australia is, and they have demonstrated that. We already have uh, midshipmen from Australia on exchange at the Naval Academy. We have uh, two classes of Australian engineers at our nuclear power school in Charleston, South Carolina. Those guys are drinking from the <laughs> fire hose just like mm. I did. I think it's eyes wide open for them because <laughs> this is an intense program. And, mm -hmm. and then they go to a prototype, which is alongside the pier. It's an old submarine that we use now as a land-based prototype that's afloat. And this is where you learn all the basics of safety and critiquing and continuous uh, process improvement and operations of the real, no kidding, uranium pile and nuclear power uh, plant on that ship. And uh, then they'll go on to uh, a submarine school after that, I presume. Uh, but uh, as far as it goes right now, those classes are down there in nuke school, and they're going to learn a lot. And, and so Australia will build this cadre of officers who are uh, trained uh, you know, in the image of a Ricovarian submariner, and then that will, make, that will help the nation become better. Uh, sooner or later, these officers will operate at sea, but eventually they'll take off the cloth of their nation and become civilians. And I think it's going to help their industrial base. The other thing it does is, uh, you know, pillar two or phase two of this is, you know, uh, besides the submarine, what does AUKUS mean? It's an alliance. And it's an alliance of like-minded nations. And personally, I think the aperture should open up for other like-minded nations. Uh, most recently, the Canadians have expressed an interest in coming on board. I think uh, nations like Japan, who have inc an incredible Navy and who are aligned with the United States, uh, would be interested in coming on board. And uh, who knows? Maybe even someday there was some bitter feelings in the beginning at the announcement of AUKUS. You get the French uh, on board as a part of this conglomerate. And, you know, allies and partners are extremely important to all of us. So you don't go anywhere and you wouldn't fight a war nowadays without a coalition because it's just not possible. 
uh, you have to pool best practices and we are stronger together. So I think this is a wonderful thing. There's going to be a, a long road to hoe for Australia. This isn't going to happen overnight. You know, we're talking about the 2030s before we get a, uh, uh, a number of Virginia class submarines down there and operating. First, you have to train the people, kind of inculcate. Uh, the uh, methodology and the culture of the nuclear Navy, both in the United Kingdom and the United States. And then you have to get a platform and then you have to train and operate before you're ready to actually go and, uh, you know, play with the big dogs at sea. And I think that uh, Australia is an incredibly capable nation with uh, a culture that is very close uh, to ours or to the United Kingdom. Uh, we're all intertwined. And uh, they have a great education system down there. They have some great engineers. And I'm really happy for them. I'm happy that they're on board this team that wants to push back against authoritarian regimes and uh, tyranny that's taking place all over the world. So welcome aboard. Indeed. And so you mentioned the two pillars of AUKUS. One of them is eventually building this AUKUS SSN, this attack submarine that's nuclear powered in the, in the 2040s. Yeah. But before then, uh, the intermediate stage is maybe providing them with Virginia class submarines. Right. And the right. first one is U.S. and U.K. submarines operating uh, out, out of Australia that's right. uh, later this decade. There are a lot of questions about U.S. shipbuilding capacity or mm -hmm. being uh, overstressed already. Um, how are we doing as a nation with our own uh, submarine building program? Yeah, this is a challenge. Uh, you know, I was just looking at uh, uh, Freedom's Forge the other day. Great book. I'm sure yes. you've read it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I did the count on how many shipyards do we have in 1945 after World War II, or, you know, mm -hmm. production during the war. Started in 1938 with the naval buildup here because we realized we were in trouble in the Pacific. 55 shipyards. East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast, all over the place, 55 55 yards. Five shipyards back in 1945. Yeah, and they produced uh, during the war something like 141 aircraft carriers, mm. 350,000 uh, uh, aircraft, uh, you know, countless numbers of submarines that, that won the Battle of Pacific and the Battle of the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, you contrast that with the Reagan defense era and the maritime strategy of 1986, we had 19 shipyards. Mm. Uh, we have since downsized to seven shipyards and four or five defense primes today. So there's some doing civilian shipping, some doing gray hull shipping. So we can't keep up with the competition, which is China. China is projected to have 430 ships by 2030. They have 350 ships today to our 297. There is a certain quality to quantity, Patrick, and I am concerned about our industrial base. but. The, a lot of people think, well, just add more industrial base, add more manufacturing, use innovative things like additive manufacturing, mm -hmm. you know, um, 3D printing. You know, could you 3D print parts? Yes, we're doing it. Could you 3D print comp big components for a ship? Yeah, I think there's people that think we can do that, and perhaps we can, but you got to make them battle ready. Uh, but just opening up a new shipyard or buying an old shipyard and, uh, and saying, Omni Domini, we're gonna now produce warships in there, is not the right answer until you solve the people problem. So we have a serious people problem in our industrial base where we can't get young men and women to enter the trades. And that's gotta change. I think that's uh, education. I think it's uh, very lucrative uh, to go and work at a place like Electric Boat, Huntington Ingalls, Fink Interior Marine Group, uh, because the salaries are, are, they're well paid to do things like welding or ship fitting. And uh, you don't end up with a lot of debt from uh, college tuition that you can't pay off for years and years. You're into uh, a steady job, you've been trained, you've become, you've gone from apprentice to craftsman to shipbuilder in a, a reasonable period of time. And uh, then you're making pretty good money. So we've got to get out there and tell that story and recruit hard. And, you know, I think with all of uh, the things that have happened in the last few years, uh, we have a number of Afghan expats, Ukrainian expats, and uh, an influx of folks from other countries seeking asylum here, many of whom are educated, many, many of whom have degrees, many of whom speak English. I think there's an opportunity there uh, to educate a labor force not in the nuclear fields, because that requires uh, security clearances, but there are other things that these, uh, uh, these folks who are coming to our country and looking for the American dream can do
to earn the right to a green card or American citizenship. I'm a naturalized citizen. Yes. I'm a believer in the melting pot. <laughs> so I think that could be a potential answer to our labor problem right there, at least in the shipyards. So there is a concern that uh, our industrial base is uh, loaded down pretty heavily right now, and we're falling behind in the maintenance and the readiness and the acquisition of new warships. And our acquisition programs and our contracting is an antiquated system. We need things, uh, we need to be able to design things better and faster. The smartest thing the Navy did in the last couple of years was to jumpstart the Constellation class frigate that's being built in Marinette Marine by Fink and Cherry Marine Group, US, it's a US company in Wisconsin, employing a lot of Wisconsinites by buying that design from the Italians. And you, you skip a, an entire generation of design and you know, maybe save a billion dollars. So we get this great ship. I was out on French class frames and Italian class frames. It's a fantastic ship. And what they do different than we do is they have uh, uh, instrumentation in their pumps and valves and systems on the ship, and they do conditions-based maintenance, which means we will go on to a destroyer or a submarine and say, for this period, in this period of time, you gotta rip this pump out and replace it. On the Frem class mm -hmm. ship, the pump is monitoring itself. And when it has a problem, it starts to vibrate, overheats, the bearings are shut, it raises its hand and goes, hey, replace me. So you're not wasting your time and resources on maintenance. I think we need to take a really hard look at this. And I think there's probably a lot we can do to cut down on waste and put those resources into the next ship that either needs to be built new construction or needs to be modernized or made ready for deployment. And that's a big debate going on right now. You see, we're decommissioning 11 ships this year, and Congress isn't very happy about that. Well, sitting here at Carnegie Mellon University, where they're number one in uh, yeah. artificial intelligence and robotics, and they do right. this. But they're, you know, we're in Pittsburgh, where there's a, a great history of, yeah. of manufacturing yeah. uh, and getting, building things and doing things. Um, and I, I see we need to replicate that and re relearn some of those skills nationwide. But, but dealing with the high end of technology here again, and just thinking about unmanned systems, uncrewed right. systems. Right. How do you think about the right balance or the right integration between um, these unmanned systems uh, displacing uh, both people and, and man platforms? I mean, or what's the right balance or how do we mix the man and machine mix? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, so for folks in my generation, uh, you know, there's a lot of us out there that, that people would call dinosaurs, right? <laughs> in other words, uh, if, it's, if it's not a man platform, it, it isn't a platform. Uh, we got to get over that. And uh, I think, you know, Admiral Rickover wanted the man, and now the man or the woman in the loop. He wanted the human brains in there. Mm. Um, you know, my ship, the Oklahoma City, was backfitted with a, a digitized control system uh, on board in, uh, in the propulsion plant. And I think uh, they had to wait until Rickover was gone before doing that because he wanted a, a man-machine interface. And that's why the training program was so intense. You know, you had to know what was going on inside that reactor plant with all of the support systems to keep the core covered. That was the goal. Keep the core covered, keep the propulsion plant operating, the screw turning, the hotel loads going, and the weapon systems powered up so you could defend the ship. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure where Admiral Rickover would be on unmanned, uh, but you've got to evolve over time. And uh, with artificial intelligence, unmanned systems, I think that's the future of not a uniquely unmanned force, but a hybrid force. And so we have to look at a, an appropriate mix. What just happened in the United States Navy? Uh, over a year and a half of experimentation, prototyping, you know, a la Rickover, out in the Arabian Gulf with Task Force 59. Um, you know, at the Center for Maritime Strategy, we've got our own podcast, Maritime Nation. I just finished a podcast last week. It's out on the internet. You guys can see it if you want on uh, www.centerformaritimestrategy.org. And it's with uh, Commodore Mike Brasseur, who was the last Commodore of Task Force 59 before he departed and was relieved. And uh, Admiral Casey Moten. Uh, Casey is the head of Unmanned, the program executive officer for Unmanned Systems and Small Combatants. So he has both LCS, Little Combat Ship, the Constellation Class Frigate, and all our unmanned programs. Huge portfolio. He's done really well. And accordingly, the Navy has nominated him to become the new PEO for aircraft carriers. Hmm. That's huge. The last guy for PEO carriers has been nominated to be Naval Sea Systems Command. So they're on the right track. 
So I talked to, uh, to Admiral Moten, I talked to Commodore Brasseur about unmanned and hybrid. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy and Admiral Gilday were so enamored with the experimentation that went on in the Arabian Gulf with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned surface vehicles of all different sizes, and uh, unmanned undersea vehicles networked in a common network and a common operating picture that stretched from the Suez to the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden through the uh, Straits of Hormuz and into the Arabian Gulf. You could see over water and over land with all of these systems. And remarkably, uh, it was a 20%, 80% split with our allies. So the U.S. Uh, absorbed about 20% of the cost for these systems. It's like Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. The allies all came and said, hey, we want a part of this. The Americans are doing this. It must be good. That's not necessarily true, but we want a part of it. So it was good because we had all the allies and partners together. Uh, we built this system, and then the Secretary of the Navy and Admiral Gilday kind of honored us in the Navy League by coming to see her in space last month in April and announcing, hey, uh, part two of Task Force 59 is we're going to go to the Fourth Fleet. Hmm. What's the Fourth Fleet? Fourth Fleet's down in Mayport, Florida. My old Commodore, Jim Aiken, is the uh, Admiral in charge of Fourth Fleet. That's the big counter drug arena in this country. And we got a problem with uh, uh, illegal, uh, we got cocaine, uh, 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 fentanyl, and that stuff is flowing into the United States, whether it comes by air or by sea or by land. And so the United States Navy is now going to have a battle laboratory down there mm. uh, to put unmanned systems at sea and help stop the, the drug problem and experiment with uh, all sorts. So you've got aircraft coming in, and you've got these semi-submersibles. They're almost a little submarine, you know, chugging along uh, with a diesel engine and an operator carrying tons of uh, cocaine. And we're going to go out and find those things and, uh, and uh, arrest them and stop the flow. So tremendous opportunity in a fairly benign environment, right? And so we can take some risks down there. I'm excited about that, and I think that's the future. Uh, the Air Force has uh, used artificial intelligence to fly an F-22. Uh, the Uni United States Navy, my classmate, uh, uh, Nasty Manazer, has pioneered the MQ-25 program, which is an uh, a unmanned aircraft. We have successfully launched and recovered it off an aircraft carrier. You can fill the wings with fuel, and uh, we're manning it remotely unmanned. It goes out and it runs a pattern. And we've had F-18 aircraft, the pointy-nosed uh, F-18 and F Hornets, refuel in the air hundreds of miles away from the carrier. The next thing to do with the MQ-25 is weaponize it, mm -hmm. put weapons on it. And then you can uh, uh, shoot over the horizon. We did this with an experiment with USS Finn a couple of years ago where uh, Finn was out at sea. It has the standard missile six, which is a, uh, a killer of a missile, a ship killer and it put an unmanned system over the horizon that detected a target, passed the targeting information back to the fin, and the fin fired a couple of hundred miles forward of its position and hit that target with a relay node that was unmanned and with fin safe and over the horizon uh, so that it could not be targeted itself, and, and it worked. That's the future, I think, of warfare. Well, we're talking with Admiral Fogo here about technology and naval strategy, and um, I wanted to ask you, Jamie, about the um, question about the future of the carrier. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's been protected by the Navy in, in war games, but also in, in terms of uh, defense budget battles. It is vital for showing presence around the world, but also for that capacity to project air power and, and, and lethal power around the world, project power. The Chinese, of course, have developed uh, an entire military modernization program largely designed to keep those aircraft carriers outside of the first and second island chain, sure. to, to be able to attack our airfields anywhere in Japan, Guam, but also those floating uh, islands, those aircraft carriers. How do, how do carriers operate in a contested environment where we're, we, we no longer can rely on technological overmatch or military overmatch? that is a pure competitor like China? I think the answer is carefully. Yes. And so most recently, uh, I know you've studied and looked at a very controversial and uh, public war game at CSIS. Mm -hmm. 
uh, our friend uh, Mark Cancy and, and uh, his son, uh, you know, Mark the Marine and his son the PhD, came and did one of our war gaming sessions at Sea Air and Space recently. In that war game, which was a Monte Carlo scenario, I think they reran it 24 times, and uh, two of our carriers uh, were disabled mm. in, in that fight. Um, you know, as my friend Admiral Scott Swift, former PAC fleet commander, will say, we're going to have to accept the fact that we're going to take some battle damage. Now, you know how the American people react to that. They don't like it. You know, let's talk uh, USS Cole and other ships uh, that have been hit in uh, combat or pseudo combat scenarios, uh, whether it's terrorism or, uh, or something else. And so uh, we don't like to see that happen. Uh, but we can no longer operate with impunity all over the globe. The game has changed. And so I think the assumption has to be that we are always going to be in a contested environment. So we have these words that we use, like a permissive environment. <laughs> you know, that, that was life in the last 40 years. We, since the end of the Cold War, we've been in a permissive environment. We can go sail anywhere and operate anywhere. Uh, Non-permissive environment, it's just uncertain. You don't know what's on the other side of the horizon. Is the enemy there? Can the enemy hit me? And then hostile environment. So hostile, contested, you got to assume you're going to be in a hostile environment. We are not operating ships in the Black Sea right now, much to my chagrin, mm. because it is a non-permissive or hostile environment. The risk is very, very high until we can kind of regulate this thing with the Russians and the, and the war in Ukraine. Uh, while we were involved being the good guys and the world cop for 20 years in the war on terror, Afghanistan and Iraq, we had not only our boots, Patrick, but our heads in the sand. And this entire time, China was quietly rearming and building a naval armaments race, and China acquired a hypersonic missile, the DF-17. China has some incredible ballistic missiles that are also uh, hypersonic, the DF-21, DF-26, known in the literature, open source, as a carrier killer, right? Mm -hmm. So that should cause us pause, and we need to figure out how to operate our crown jewel, the aircraft carrier, in a posture where it can operate safely and that we can strike from a longer distance. Now, the problem in the Pacific is the tyranny of distance. If there is ever a dust up between us and the Chinese, the Chinese are playing the home game. They, have the, they will have the advantage, like Ukraine has the advantage, of playing a home game. And uh, China has virtually uh, weaponized the first and second island chain where um, heretofore we were able to operate uh, with impunity. So we have to think through that. We have to think over the horizon. We have to develop weapon systems that can outstick the adversary, meaning range and lethality. Hybrid warfare or unmanned systems play a part of this. You can take more risk with an unmanned system. I would much rather take risk with uh, an unmanned platform that was weaponized than I would with uh, an F-18 uh, that has one or two uh, people in the cockpit. Um, but if we have to make those risks, that's what we're trained to do throughout our career and as commanders and as leaders. You know, if it comes to the national security and defense of the homeland, uh, our people are going to take those risks and our people are going to do their job and they're going to go out there and they're going to fight uh, for the right outcome for America. So there's a lot to think about and unpack there. And we've got some of the best people on it. Admiral Paparo and Admiral Aquilino are both friends of mine. I have the utmost confidence in those two leaders. You probably saw Admiral Paparo recently on 60 Minutes. I thought he did a great job yes. talking about, you know, what will we do if there is a hostile attack on the island of Taiwan? First thing the Navy will do was look to our civilian leadership and say, what are our orders, sir? And from the commander in chief and the secretary of defense on down. And if uh, the answer is you will help the Taiwanese people defend Taiwan, that's what we're going to do. And that's what they're thinking about out there. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at all these things and us being really smart about it, too. You know, I'm going to take part in a, a war game this summer called Large Scale Exercise 2023. And uh, <laughs> half of that exercise is done in port through live virtual constructive training. So we've put a lot of effort into simulation. So we'll have half the fleet actually at sea, and say you have a carrier strike group at sea, you might have another carrier strike group operating ashore with the, the battle staff in a maritime operations center. And you can get almost as much training out of that as you can being at sea. Now again, call me a dinosaur, there's no substitute for being at sea, <laughs> but if you're not burning fuel 
increasing the carbon footprint of the fleet and putting wear and tear on not just the hardware but the software, the people, I think it's a good deal, especially if it's in peacetime and it's training. And so uh, I uh, laud, I applaud uh, the resources that are being put into live virtual constructive to make us a better Navy and to be able to counter those threats which are the uh, long-range threats from uh, mainland China, should, that, should it ever come to that. And by God, I hope it doesn't. Because if we get into a conflict with China and it becomes uh, serious um, and kinetic, uh, that is a disaster for the global community. Indeed. The um, flip side of that metaverse uh, and the great simulation work that's going on is the vulnerability of our cyber systems, of our space systems, the new domains. Um, how do you think we are doing as a Navy and as an armed forces generally to protect uh, our armed forces in these new domains, electro electromagnetic warfare uh, and other threats? Yeah, I think the Navy has embraced this wholeheartedly. And Admiral Mike Gilday, the CNO, is uh, probably one of the most well-qualified people next to uh, General Nakasone at the uh, National Security Agency because uh, Mike, who's a good friend, was a uh, 10th Fleet Commander over at NSA. You know, 10th Fleet is a building at, at Fort Meade. It's not yes. a fleet headquarters like 6th Fleet. But those guys are doing uh, mm -hmm. cyber monitoring, cyber protection, cyber experimentation all over the world. And it became evident um, a few years ago. Um, you know, I, I know you've read uh, Kill Chain by Chris Bros. Uh, Senator McCain was not big on uh, <laughs> old antiquated systems uh, like JSTARS, which is a battlefield management system. I used it in Libya during uh, Joint Task Force Odyssey Dawn and Unified Protector to look at the battlefield, see where uh, uh, Qaddafi's center of gravity is, where, you know, the 32nd Brigade, and then find, fix, and finish those uh, uh, assets that were uh, conducting, you know, genocide on his own people. And that was our charter in a UN Security Council resolution. So it worked great, but that again was a non-permissive environment. I mean, Qaddafi had some missile systems on the ground, but the aircraft was flying high and it gave you an incredible picture. We're, not, we're no longer going to have that luxury. So you fly a J-STARS into a hostile uh, environment out in the Pacific and somebody, the bad guys are going to knock it down. So we came up with this uh, Joint All Domain Command and Control, JADC2, which you've heard about, and uh, we don't talk much about it. No. Uh, it's been uh, you know, a very hush-hush program. Um, you know, JADC2, each of the services have their own version of it. Uh, the Navy calls it overmatch. And the Navy's been doing this for a long time. Uh, I think it was Admiral uh, Woody Lewis deployed with Theodore Roosevelt when I was 6th Fleet Commander back in 2014 or 15 with something, another acronym called NIFCA, Navy Integrated uh, Fires Counter Air. So we have uh, an E2D, which is a platform you can launch off the carrier to go out, take a look at the environment, and do the battle management and put weapons on target. And so that was, like I said, 2015, eight years ago. Uh, that's kind of, you know, I, I described the USS Finn, the over, over the horizon shot of the SM-6. That's the kind of thinking that we need as we look to the future in JADC-2. We're going to be operating in a contested environment, which means somebody is probably going to take away our GPS satellites. And GPS and precision navigation and timing are critical to uh, putting weapons on target. Hmm. So how do you get around that? How do you create a uh, system that can find, fix, and finish the enemy uh, with targeting information that is going to be resilient and robust in time of war when somebody's knocking down your satellites? And that is a real challenge. And so I'll stop short uh, there, but I'll say this is nothing new. If you go back and look at uh, Peter Singer's book, Wired for War, he talks about a great American in that book named uh, Admiral Art Zabrowski, you know, who was uh, at the War College after Admiral Kurth, uh, Audrey's father. Uh, I loved Admiral Kurth and Admiral Zabrowski too. Admiral Zabrowski was a big brain. And uh, Rumsfeld realized that and plucked him from the War College, promoted him vice admiral and put him in Andy Marshall's office in net assessments. And he launched this campaign in, uh, in uh, the day of transformation, Rumsfeld's transformation, and the, the revolution in military affairs called network-centric warfare. I really think that that's kind of JADC2 today. Hmm. It's a network that's ganged together with the Joint Force, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. We're all communicating, we're all sharing information, we're all protecting one another in this robust network that cannot be violated by the enemy. And uh, 
and we're conducting our campaigning at sea or in the air or on the land uh, with a certainty that we're going to uh, have a big probability of a win because we know our communication systems and our networks work. So unfortunately, Admiral Zabrowski died of cancer back in uh, you know 2001, 2002, and then we got into the war on terror. And that's why I say we had our boots and our heads in the sand. We were fully focused on this war on terror, the forever war, until uh, you know we got out of Afghanistan, we're withdrawing from Iraq, and we're not doing combat operations anymore. And then we looked around and said, holy cow, <laughs> how many of cyber actors are there out there that threaten us? Well, there's violent extremist organizations. There's the Iranians that are pretty good at uh, cyber warfare, the Russians who have always been good at cyber warfare, and the Chinese who are really good at cyber warfare. And not just cyber warfare in the colonial pipeline, cyber warfare in space. We've created uh, a space command. I'm all in. I'm all for it. And so I think the United States is catching up, just like we are in the, uh, uh, the build and test and prototyping of hypersonics. We'll get there. It's going to take a couple of years. The question is, how long do we have? And you've all heard about the, the 2027 window, you know, and oh my God, something's going to happen by 2027. I think uh, the war in Ukraine, as tragic as it may be, may have helped us with that because we've seen what happens when, you know, a, uh, a Cold War-esque Army, Navy, and Air Force get involved in a sophisticated campaign against an adversary who has the home team advantage. And I'm talking Russia, failure of logistics, failure of leadership, and failure to gain a ground in the combat zone against a, uh, the mouse that roared. You know, uh, Ukraine, who has shown us incredible resilience, bravery, courage, and tenacity as they defend their own ground. Well, Admiral Fogo, I feel like uh, you could go on for a long time, but you don't have uh, a long time before you have to give a speech today. Um, you've been extremely generous, but I, I just cannot thank you enough for what you've done for the country, but what you've done here today for the CMIS program to talk uh, with me about leadership, about what it takes to uh, succeed in a career in the Navy, what it takes for the Navy to succeed at sea uh, and to take its responsibility seriously. Um, from Admiral Rick over to the present day, to the, this bold future where technology interacts with, with uh, very traditional uh, aspects of, of combat and duty. Um, so on behalf of uh, CMIST and Carnegie Mellon University, I want to thank you very much and wish you and your position as Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League uh, continued success. And thank you again for what you're doing. Patrick, I can't thank you enough uh, for your time and for everything you've done today. And I would have to, have to end on this note. And that is, I think a lot of these problems we've discussed today could be uh, addressed um, if the Navy had a current maritime strategy. Just uh, met uh, Secretary John Lehman last week the master of strategy from 1986. We were all mobilized, we were all on the same sheet of music, and that's what we need as we look to a transition here with a future CNO. I would say uh, take a look at uh, Admiral Zumwalt's Project 60, 60 days on the job, what do you need, and let's get a strategy that uh, tells our, our congressional leadership how many ships we need, what types of ships we need, and how we're going to fight the nation's wars. And if we can do that, I think we're going to be successful. So thanks so much for your uh, your indulgence today. It's an honor to be here at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Thank you again. Thank you, sir.